Welcome to this podcast from Concordia Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Charles Gieschen, and I'll be speaking today on the gospel lesson for Pentecost 26, Series C, which is Luke chapter 21, verses 5 to 28. Uh, the reading can go on to verse 38, but because of the length of the reading, I'll be focusing just through uh, verse 28. Just a couple of words of an introduction before we jump into the Greek text. Uh, with Pentecost 26, our focus is shifting in the readings to the end times. So we, during many Sundays of the, uh, of after Pentecost, we've read somewhat chronologically through several texts in Luke. Here we take a jump forward to the eschatological discourse. Why? Because it, we're at the end of the church year where the themes of the lectionary focus on the end times, the challenges of being faithful in these end times, vigilant watching, and then also the return, the glorious triumphal return, the parousia of Christ. And we see especially in this text the emphasis on signs that, this, that we are living in this end time. And uh, one of the big ones is related to uh, what Jesus says about the temple and about what will be happening in the decades and the centuries following his death and resurrection. So, uh, with that in mind and the, the focus on the end times, let's jump to uh, the actual text, Luke chapter 5, verse 21. We see here, uh, as it's printed out, uh, we have, um, you have Jesus emphasizing uh, some things in the context of the temple. It appears that his disciples were near the temple, so they, some were speaking right here. Some people were speaking participle concerning the temple. Why? Uh, because there were these beautiful stones uh, and there is this emphasis we see later on in verse 6 on the stones of the temple. Uh, this is a reference to not the second temple as it had been re rebuilt after the Babylonian exile, but the second temple as it had been completely um, refurbished, expanded, and, and certainly uh, enhanced during the period uh, beginning with Herod the Great. It was one of the big uh, building projects of Herod the Great was, and in part, was to help put Israel on the map in the Roman world. Uh, that was one of Herod's goals, but it also endeared him to the Jewish authorities to have their temple given that kind of attention. But it was a very beautiful structure, uh, and that's what uh, was being spoken about. Uh, it had been adorned with these beautiful uh, raw, uh, stones plus um, the offerings. People had given votive offerings. And so there was this speaking. And you have then Jesus saying in this context of others speaking about the temple, they're sitting here praising it. And what does Jesus say? He says, these things which you are seeing, and obviously he's standing in the context of the temple, uh, uh, days will come. So here's, that's an eschatological word. Days will come, future tense, obviously speaking, after his own death and resurrection in the uh, years following that. Days will come uh, in which there will not be left, not be left uh, right here, stone upon stone, uh, which that will not be pulled down. Here you have, again, you have two passive verbs right here. And again, one could say these are divine passives in the sense that who is the actor behind these, this action, this action of uh, stone not being left upon stone and these things uh, being pulled down. It's, it's finally God's the actor. Roman. Uh, soldiers would, in A.D. 70, after the siege of Jerusalem, actually level the temple mount in the sense of bring down the temple. So all that's left is the, the base. However, finally, uh, it was part of, the, of God's end-time judgment uh, upon Israel for the rejection of the Messiah. And uh, one can say this text is reflecting that. Uh, this 
prophecy actually hit me very strongly when I was in Israel, and I, I looked at the base of uh, the Wailing Wall area, and you actually have stones there that have been uncovered that date from when Rome threw down stones from the Temple Mount. It's just a reminder that what is said in verse 6 is a, um, a prophecy that Jesus spoke that came true, and so these other things in the context of uh, the, these words of prophecies are other things that Jesus is speaking uh, that are prophetic words that we uh, should trust and know uh, will, um, will, are, have, or will come true. Uh, he goes on in, uh, in, in verse 7, uh, uh, Luke does, and he says, Then they asked him, namely the people that heard him just speak these words about the stones being thrown down from the Temple Mount, they asked him, saying, Teacher, that's a polite address, he's a rabbi. His disciples sometimes call him didaskale, teacher. And so also these people that are, uh, that are listening to him. And important interrogatives. When and then what? Uh, when we're talking about the end times, that's a big question. When are these things to be? And then what are the signs? What is the sign when these things are about to take place? Uh, one can say that this particular question is kind of the, the, the very typical question whenever you're in discussions about the end times, is when is it happening and how do we know? What is the sign that these things, that the end times are actually upon us? So what does Jesus say in response to this? He says, uh, see, and here again you have a present imperative, very emphatic, see that you are not led astray. Uh, and uh, there you again have this language of, of warning that's so typical of, of Jesus teaching about the end times. Uh, why does he want them not to be led astray? Because many will come in my name. This is a phrase that we see twice uh, in these few verses. And uh, uh, I would emphasize that it's people uh, that are imitating the true God. And Jesus is the only one who shares the, the, the name of God. He is Yahweh in the flesh. But there's others that come imitating him. They're false gods. And what are they saying? Ego I me. We know from, from uh, the Gospels that this was a self-disclosure formula Jesus used. He spoke as God speaks in, in the Old Testament. Uh, he is the one who says, it is I or I am. Uh, there is no other God like me. This is found at the end of Deuteronomy. It's found several times in Isaiah. This is the, the way Yahweh speaks. It's the way Jesus spoke in the Gospels, stilled the storm by simply saying, Ego I me, I am. Uh, and there will be others that basically come claiming to be the true God, claiming to be Yahweh, claiming to be Jesus. And he says, uh, see that you are not led astray by that kind of uh, false God. Uh, there will be one coming of Jesus, and that will be the final coming of Jesus. Anything that, uh, any um, person that comes claiming to be God uh, here on earth before the last day dawns, that's a false uh, God, of an, an idol. Uh, you have here Hakairos. Uh, the emphasis is this, this unique time of fulfillment, uh, is near. So you have the emphasis, obviously, it's very close. It has drawn near. It is present. Uh, we aren't living in a time where we think the end times are distant. No, Jesus has already come, fulfilled. We live in this in-between time between his first coming and second coming. And so we live in these unique times of, uh, of the end times. And we don't see the end times as distant. We're in the midst of them. That's an important thing. The, the tendency is because from our perspective, we think Jesus has taken a long time to return because it's been 2,000 years since his first coming. But again, from God's perspective, we are in this very unique 
short time between Christ's first coming and his final coming, and these are the latter days. And so Jesus warns uh, after he, uh, uh, but he says, uh, do not journey after them. Namely, don't go after these false teachers. Uh, but when you hear, again, this language, uh, hatan, you're going to see a subjunctive verb after it. You have it there. When you hear, and what are you going to hear of? Wars uh, and insurrections, namely the kind of unrest that happens among sinful men. Uh, do not panic right here. Do not um, uh, be thrown off. Uh, because it is necessary, you have this word in Luke frequently, uh, so it's a divine necessity that for these things to take place uh, first, namely before the actual end, here Jesus speaks of that as the telos, the last day. Um, so the emphasis is when these things are taking place, wars, insurrections, and the like, uh, uh, you're not yet at the end. The, the, um, the, uh, the, every generation, we see wars and rumors of wars. We see interactions. All of those things remind us we are living in the latter days. They keep us on that, uh, in that mode of expecting Christ's return, respecting the last day, living in that expectation rather than saying, oh, everything's going to be great for centuries and millennia we we don't need to have any concern about the mission of the church or upon for our own vigilance because this is a, a distant day no there's much more of a an imminent expectation that jesus is cultivating and we see that in the text like this then uh, verse 10 he goes on uh, jesus says or continues to say to them or begin, begins to t t uh, tell them more. Uh, you have the imperfect verb there. Then you have uh, the main verb, uh, where you have nation uh, here, uh, will go against, rise up, future tense verb, against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. So again, reinforcing this language of wars and insurrections, just reinforced with the actual discussion of nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, the kind of civil strife, we see it in every generation. We see it in our own generation. And then also, not only among people, but in the, the cosmos, in the, the actual creation, the world, there's going to be a, a seismos, seismoi, namely earthquakes, and they're not just little ones, but big earthquakes. We, we've seen it in our own generations with uh, great earthquakes that have caused even huge tsunamis. Just reminding us, we're living in the latter days. And then you have the emphasis that in various places, there's going to be famines. So in various places, there's going to be famines and uh, there's going to be uh, plagues. These will come about future tense. So the kind of things that happen not only among people, but also on creation where earthquakes, famines, plagues, uh, there will be both uh, terrifying events. You see the, 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 um, uh, the root phobe, uh, the, to, from phobeo is the verb, uh, to fear something. There are going to be terrifying events uh, and, um, and great signs. So not only terrifying events on earth, but also signs from heaven, uh, great ones and they will take place again in the future. So not only among people, but also among the world, we see evidence of living in the latter days. Then verse 12 goes on. Jesus says, before all these things, right here, before all these things, um, they will lay their hands on you. Here he gets into what will be the consequences that Christians will face in the latter days. And some very dire warning here that uh, they will lay hands on you uh, here, the, um, uh, upon you, namely upon uh, Christians, uh, and, um, and they will persecute you. You have that language of persecution right there. Betraying you right here. This uh, language of handing over has the technical sense, this participle of the betraying. 
unto the synagogues. And so the understanding of here, persecution coming from uh, fellow Jews uh, against these Jewish Christians. Uh, in, so they will be training you into the synagogues and, and into even prisons. So there's religious and civic persecution that's being spoken about here. Uh, you being led away, here again, this language of being led away un, uh, by, uh, unto kings and governors. So again, the kind of civic action against you. Uh, certainly we can, uh, we can uh, identify with how this is seeming to be growing in our own culture with civic actions uh, against Christians uh, for their witness. Why? All of this is going to take place on account of my name. We saw people claiming to come in his name and those that truly confess his name, uh, namely confess Jesus as Lord, this is what they will face uh, because they confess him to be the king of their, their world and life and their Lord. Uh, verse 13, uh, it mentions there, it will result for you uh, as a witness. Namely, this will be an opportunity for you to be a living martyr, a martyr who testifies to Jesus, uh, what he has done, and who he is. Uh, so this language of martyreon, it doesn't mean that uh, everyone's going to die because they have testified but some may indeed die, and that's brought out in these few verses. And then Jesus encourages um, his listeners, so place in your hearts, hear that language from tithe me, uh, there you have the imperative, theta, therefore, in your hearts, right here, um, to, uh, to not be concerned, right here, the language of not be concerned, beforehand to, to speak in defense of yourself, to give an apology, uh, one might say is more of a literal translation, to, de to defend yourself. So this is very much like the apostolic ministry discourse in Matthew where Jesus is saying, you know, don't worry, I'm going to give you what to say when you face these kinds of challenges, the same kind of teaching we have here in Luke's eschatological discourse. And that's brought out in the next verse where Jesus says, I, and there's a beautiful emphatic personal pronoun, very much for emphasis. I, I will give you beautiful words of gospel. I myself will give you, uh, uh, will give to you a mouth, a stoma, namely what to speak, as well as sophion, the wisdom of what to say, um, uh, wisdom, which all of those who are basically, who are uh, going against you, who are opposing you, they will not be able to overcome it. So they're, speak, they're, they're going against you, but they won't be able to overcome you. Um, namely, uh, what <clears throat> they won't be able to oppose what you stand against and uh, what you are speaking against. So what you are standing against right here uh, and what you are speaking against. They will not be able to um, overcome that. And then verse 16. And you have, um, you will not be betrayed right here. Again, that paro, paradidomi we saw a little earlier. Here we see it again. Uh, this language of betrayal, um, the emphasis here is you will be handed over or betrayed. And who may be the ones who are betraying? We see this, some of the closest loved ones, parents, um, siblings, uh, such as uh, brothers, uh, and uh, here other relatives, as well as your philone, your friends, your your. your your special um, loved ones. They <clears throat> will put to death some of you. Here is this language of that our witness, our martyr, our, um, our, 
our emphasis on um, being martyrs can even lead to the uh, to death. Right here, verse 16 is testimony to that. And uh, then uh, you will be hated. This language here of uh, a you future tense will be hated ones. Why? If we could move up the text a little bit right here uh, so we can see the verse 17 and following. There we go. Uh, so you're going to be hated. This is the language right here of this participle. And you have this language of the participle, you will be hated by all on account of my name. Uh, that's, um, again, that phrase that we saw frequently, because Jesus is confessed as Lord. We confess him as being the true God. We confess him to be Yahweh. And then verse 18 continues, and a hair from your head will not perish. Beautiful, comforting gospel right here. Uh, and you have this ume plus the subjunctive. Uh, again, when, when Jesus speaks in teaching, uh, that kind of construction is absolute assurance. It will not be damaged. Uh, so the emphasis is God will watch over us. Some of us will, will, um, will even be, um, uh, go through the hardship of even being put to death, and yet God will preserve us in the faith and this image of not having a hair harmed, I think, is especially emphasizing how will we, we will be spiritually protected. Uh, we will not um, uh, have uh, our faith taken away. We will, we will be able to continue strong in that. And then finally, uh, verse 19, uh, you have that hupomone, steadfastness, is a, uh, by your perseverance, um, here, gain your suke, your, your, um, your, your selves, your entire selves. Sometimes it's translated your souls, but it's your suke is your, your individual lives, your individual self. So uh, this, this is a theme, one might say, when you're preaching, to really stress this steadfastness, this um, recognizing the kind of hardships that will come and yet remaining steadfast in the faith. Then in this next section, beginning with verse 20, you have a little bit more focus specifically on what's going to happen to Jerusalem. We can say that what happened in the destruction of Jerusalem is a type or a foreshadowing of the end time destruction against unbelief. And we see that in these few verses. Jesus warns, when you see Jerusalem, so when... Whenever you have a hot on, you have a subjunctive verb, it's right there. When you see uh, Jerusalem being surrounded here by the soldiers, armies, if you will, uh, this is a reference to what Rome did, putting Jerusalem to siege, uh, then, um, you, then you will know right here that her, her devastation is near. Okay, it has arrived and is near. So this is a prophetic speech from Jesus about what will happen in the decades ahead for Jerusalem. And then more warning for people living then in that area. Then those in Judea uh, must flee into the mountains. And you have several verbs here. So they must flee into the mountains. And the ones in the middle of her... Here's the next verb, next major verb. Um, must not enter into her, uh, namely go back into Jerusalem. It was the big hub of activity, but when these kinds of things are happening, stay away. Many Christians fled from Jerusalem before the siege actually took place. And so, although there's a strong Christian presence in Jerusalem, um, uh, that, those Christians fled in the sense they obeyed this prophecy uh, as it was before it, um, uh, it uh, came about in the sense of uh, the siege of, of Rome, uh, the siege of Jerusalem by Rome. And then you have the final verb, and the ones, um, uh, let me see here, yeah, 
and uh, those in the country, right here, and the ones in the country uh, must uh, travel out. Uh, so the emphasis of, of um, getting out of that region because of the things that are happening. So three important verbs. Uh, you have must flee, and then um, uh, uh, must travel out, uh, and must not uh, here enter into her. So travel out, and then must not enter into her. Then you have in verse uh, 22, because these are the days of vengeance. That's the language again, eschatological fil fulfillment. These are days that uh, have been prophesied. These are, are uh, and they uh, must come to fulfillment. You have that language of fulfillment, two different places in these final verses. And uh, then it says, woe, this is more of a prophetic word. We see it uh, a lot in the uh, prophets. It's found here in the teaching of Jesus. Woe for those who have in the womb and for those nurturing in those days. So this in the womb is pregnant mothers and those that are nurturing uh, young children in those days. Why? It's just harder because you have children in tow uh, and, uh, and to, to react to these things. So it's a warning and uh, um, very common. One can say, there will be distress over the land and wrath for this people. Uh, so again, this language of distress, great distress and wrath uh, in what happened in, those, um, in the destruction of Jerusalem. We see a small uh, prophetic picture of what God's end time judgment will be for one reason, unbelief. And that's an important question. Jesus isn't punishing every sin on the last day. He's punishing one sin. He punished sins in Jesus. He's punishing unbelief on the last day. And then it emphasizes in verse 24, uh, for they will fall by the mouth of the sword. Uh, you have that language here in verse uh, 24, the mouth of the sword. And <clears throat> they will be taken as captives. So this emphasis of what will happen to the Jews, they will be taken as captives uh, of, um, of um, to all the Gentiles. You have that ta ethnic here, all the Gentiles. And um, Jerusalem, right here, what will happen to the city? It will continue to be walked upon, trodden upon by the Gentiles. Uh, emphasis again, what would happen through Rome's conquest of Jerusalem. And then you have this language of, of um, until the appointed times, right here, the Kai Roy, uh, have been fulfilled. Again, Jesus' prophecy gives us a sense of the end time judgment. This kind of event in history, you can read about it in Josephus, very, um, very vivid uh, judgment of God, just gives us a sense of judgment against unbelief on the last day. So to look at Jerusalem is to understand the judgment of unbelief on the last day. To look at Jerusalem in uh, 70 is to understand something about judgment against unbelief in the last day. And finally, verses 25 through 28 uh, are more general in, in sense. And here it's speaking about how there will be uh, future tense signs. And where are those signs? Cosmic signs. Signs in the sun, helio. Signs in the moon and the stars, so the cosmic testimony to the latter days. And on earth, upon the earth, there's going to be anguish among the nations. That's just picking up on the earlier language uh, that uh, Jesus taught about the physical uh, signs of the end as well as the turmoil among people that are signs of the end. So the anguish of nations in perplexity. This is verse 25. And then you have also uh, at, at the sound and tossing of the sea right here. Uh, and so the sound and the tossing of the sea right here. Verse 26, while men are fainting from fear, here the language of fear comes up again because of uh, seeing 
what they are doing while present participle men are fainting from fear and expectation right here of the things that are taking place, um, uh, namely coming upon the inhabited earth. The oikomene is, is the earth that, uh, that people are familiar with. The, for for, for uh, this area, it would be the Mediterranean world, if you will. Uh, these things are, will be worldwide, but uh, they are happening right around Jerusalem and right in the Mediterranean world. Okay? And uh, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Here again, the emphasis of cosmic activity happened. Will be shaken. Again, passive. We can see this as a so-called divine passive. Who's going to be doing the shaking? God is the one who is the creator of the heavens and the earth and overseer of that. And then finally, these, these closing verses. Um, and then they will see the Son of Man coming. Here we finally get to the ultimate end. Uh, these kinds of things happen in every generation. That there are, is turmoil among people, there is turmoil in the cosmos, earthquakes, tsunamis, etc. Uh, all these things are reminding that us that we're living in the latter days the key marker of what's going to happen at the end, verse 27. Then they will see, until we see the Son of Man, right here, fulfillment of Daniel 7, 13, Jesus came as the Son of Man, was established as the King who began his reign in his death and resurrection. That's when he began his reign. He brings that reign to its completion, to its consummation on the last day. And we will see him coming. He ascended in clouds. He will return on clouds. The Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and, and much glory. So as this one who is crucified will come as the conquering uh, king on the last day, both to deliver his people and to judge unbelief. And then Jesus encourages, um, the, fi and the final uh, verse of this text encourages people, so when these things, right here, these things um, begin to be, to take place, then what are we to do? Then lift up and also um, uh, then straighten up, if you will, and, and also lift up your heads. So uh, this is a posture of being ready, of being in expectation. Why? Because your redemption. And here, let's, uh, when we're preaching this text, let's not forget this final word of the text. Great opportunity to emphasize here Christ's work of redemption that was accomplished on the cross really is brought to its ultimate completion when he returns. Our redemption draws near in the sense of the redemption of our body accomplished in the cross is brought to completion with the resurrection of the body and the restoration of creation. And so uh, the, the joyfulness with which we can look forward to, to these challenges of the end time is really um, brought out with this final strong gospel promise. Well, may the Lord bless your proclamation uh, of this text uh, in the, um, these latter days. Um, thank you very much.